switch over to this. And he ended up that season still number one. And this is his 11th year over the hill. He ends up number one in the league. Most catches, most touchdowns, most yards gained. And then he went into the 12th seat, did the same thing again. He's just coming out with a book. And his name is Tony Gonzalez. There was a big, about a page and a half article um, on him and our work in the Wall Street Journal that occurred just a little over a year ago. I'm finding that professional athletes, but not just professional athletes, young guys, usually guys, who are taking all these protein supplements to get muscle mass, mm -hmm. bad deal. The average age of death of National Football League players, for example, who have played at least five years, the average age of death is 56 years. And it's not because they're getting banged up and stuff like that, like they're told. They're getting diabetes, obesity, heart disease, cancer, and things like this. So there's another whole territory that we're going to have to pay some attention to. Uh, okay, I, I'm getting to the point where, as, as a matter of fact, I, I, I really think, you know, we have so uh, micromanaged our whole health system. Do we have individual names for all these different diseases that we got? We look for a mechanism, we look for single, single causes, all this kind of, you know, we only have one grand disease, really. <laughs> and you can think for yourself about where, what's the origin of the one grand disease. <coughs> we just give it different names. We call it cancer here, we call it heart disease there, we call it, I mean, different organs and so forth and so on. So I, I would like to actually present the idea that it really is one grand disease, and they, depending on what you get, what I get, and so forth and so on, is going to depend, of course, to some extent, on genetic predisposition, among other things. But basically, it will do the wrong thing, we get the, the wrong result. So I have a definition of nutrition is different than what I was taught, and different from the nutrition that I taught myself to my students in the early years of my career. We always tend to focus on, here's what vitamin C does, you know, and here's what vitamin E does, and so forth and so on. Uh, I think it's much better to think about it this way. It involves integrated effects of countless food constituents, and what number can we talk about? Hundreds of thousands of different kinds of chemicals in food? I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. It involves infinitely complex mechanisms. And nutrition, when supported, of course, by exercise, and there's a synergy there that's important. Adequate hydration, sunshine. It's greater than the sum of its parts. It really is a symphony going on in every one of our three trillion cells in our body. And the body is always trying to create health or let's say recreate health if we're, if we're in trouble. The body's always working to the end. And it turns out that you know, if we give the right buffet to the body at any point in time with all these hundreds of thousands of different things, the body can choose which amongst all these things will take in any nanosecond in, in time to send here, there, whatever. I mean, it's, 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 we, we, we have ignored what nature can do by the science we do. And we've really gotten off track this kind of thing. So where does nutrition fit into our society? You know, there's a lot of confusion. I, I get really frustrated because I, I, any day, pick up the newspaper, listen to television, something else. I mean, there's another sort of statement that comes up as off track, it's from, my, from my perspective. So where does it fit in? <laughs> it doesn't. It just doesn't. So then the question arises, why not? Well, I spent about 20 years working on international and national policy, been on a variety of expert panels, National Academy and places like that. And so I've had a chance to see the interface between, on the one hand, the development of public information derived from scientific research. It's a bad story. It's a bad story. It's big slippage between what, in fact, we can learn in science, what we have learned in science to some extent, and the extent to which we actually then mismanage all this information. So I say it's poorly understood by the public. Research funding from the National Institutes of Health hardly exists. Let me give you a sample. You might, you might wonder, I mean, all my, my research is funded by NIH. If, okay, I got five minutes, that's about right. Uh, my, my work was supported, our work was supported, uh, as I say, mostly by NIH over the years. But you know, NIH has 27 institutes and programs and centers. Got the Heart Institute, the Cancer Institute, this and that. 27 institutes. Do you know there's not one institute called the Institute of Nutrition? Yet nutrition is by far and away the single most important intervention or causal agent for our disease problems in our entire spectrum of things. They don't care to have one institute. And I've been involved and actually arguing this point with 
and I, uh, people, including the directors, and uh, they want to avoid the word. You know, they're changing the word nutrient to nutraceutical. I think you get the message. They want to talk about chemo prevention when they're talking about diet. You find these words all over the place. Photo, you know, phytochemicals, as if the whole thing is a chemical, sort of uh, a pie or something like this. I mean, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, you know, two to four percent of the money in NCI and National Heart and Lung, they, by their admission, two to four percent is given to nutrition-oriented projects. <laughs> Don't kid you. I mean, that money is actually being spent for doing clinical trials, randomized clinical trials on single nutrients. That's not nutrition. I got away with doing the stuff I guess we did over the years because we were mostly focused on trying to understand cancer. <laughs> and I was just using nutrition as a means. They say, say it was the tail wagging the dog, you know, in a sense. And so that's how it happened. Um, you know, there's not a medical school in this country, I'm sure you know, this, that actually trained our students in nutrition. And there's a reason why. Because medicine is highly reductionist, focused on one thing at a time. That's what medicine is all about. Nutrition is not that. We, won't under, we cannot understand nutrition. The doctors don't get to understand nutrition when they actually come from that, that arena. So doctors who are held by the public, physicians, held by the public to be the key arbitrators, counselors, and so forth, of what we should be thinking about health, they're not trained. Yet even in NIH or the 27 institutes and FDA, nutrition is sort of set aside, ignored, and the directors of NIH have to be the very people who are not trained, namely the people who graduate from medical schools. So there has been a systematic, consistent uh, denigration of the whole concept of what nutrition has been about for years and years. The last one there, I won't go into that, it's kind of interesting. So I pose this question. Pardon? The answer is government. Uh, yeah, but the government is only exporting or uh, collecting information from the industry. <laughs> yeah. The government's not looking out for our interests. And I, I speak as, you know, one of the people who was involved in doing that kind of stuff, I think. So, uh, oh, it didn't just cut me off my projector. My best picture. Jeez. <laughs> it's a bunch of dollar bills, really what it is. <laughs> I, uh, I know the conference here has had some interest in, uh, I guess Garrett had indicated this to me, some of the experiences that I've had. I've had, unfortunately, a lot of experience in the last 10, 20, 15 years, I guess now, being on most people's blacklist at times, uh, even though our publication number in excess of 300 and it's in the best journals and I got NH funding and all like that. Uh, I taught a class at Cornell just to mention one thing. I taught this class at Cornell for seven years. Very popular, well attended, lecture course, a lot of pre-med students. In fact, they went off to medical school and then I got an invitation to go to the medical school to talk about it too. Anyhow, the class is really great. And um, it just got, it all of a sudden, two years ago, four or five years ago, it disappeared from the catalog. I didn't know why it disappeared. I quickly went to the curriculum committee and said, what are you doing? He said, we didn't do that, the director did it. Don't worry about it, keep on doing it. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> the director did it will not explain to me why it was taken out of the course catalog. In spite of my taking it to the faculty senate, and around, they won't explain why it was taken out of the catalog. It's that simple. Just so happens the director is the most influential consultant for the dairy industry in the world. <laughs> and of all the things I've talked about, the dairy, the product, food, the, the food that comes from uh, the dairy industry is got to be one of the most problematic foods that we actually consume. And we've known that for a long time. But the industry is speaking louder than I'm speaking. And so there is resistance from this kind of information for all kinds of reasons, scientific, economic, culturally, and in many other ways, to not to tell this information to the public. When in fact, it has the most potential, anything I can think of in medicine, to create health for the public. Thank you. questions. Uh, one thing that we've been asked is could the speaker please repeat the questions and then answer them since we don't have a microphone. Uh, please. Uh, actually, all right, go ahead. 